So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just giving it a moment while people are coming to join us. Great, I think we're probably at the core rate. Good evening, it's very happy to have you all with us this Wednesday evening. Uh, my name is David Strain. I'm a clinical senior lecturer working in the Diabetes and Vascular Research Center at the University of Exeter Medical School. And I, tonight I am delighted to be joined by James who works in the Eden Educational Center and he's the research associate based at the Leicester Diabetes Center. Sarah Gregory, who's a clinical lead at the Medway Community Healthcare Center. And my very good friend, Amal Patana, who's a consultant diabetologist in West Midlands. And the subject of tonight is gonna to be talking about managing diabetes in the care homes, and particularly how we can address the unmet need in order to, uh, to get to our patients and their carers during these particularly difficult times. I want to start off with a, a thank you to Sanofi who's given us an arm's length grant. That is to say, they are kindly agreed to provide the, the infrastructure to have tonight's meeting, but they've had no say whatsoever in the content. I also want to thank the Care Show who have put us in touch with many of you. And of course, the Eden Group who are based up in Leicester, who have provided much of our educational meetings. So diabetes in care homes is a hugely important area. We know that there is a tremendous number of people living with diabetes in the care homes, and as many as one in four people there. And they are very different to those people living with diabetes in the community. Amar, would you like to tell us about how these people are different from the general population living with diabetes? Thank you, David. Yes, um, as you said, a very important area. We're dealing essentially older adults with diabetes a lot of the time. Now, whenever we talk about older adults, it's, it's important to differentiate age from this term of frailty. Now, as, as we, we all know, it's difficult to say when someone is old in that classification, as you say. Um, we can't put a number on that. I have seen five olds who are healthier and, and, and fitter than I am. So how can I say someone is old and say when they meet, when, when we talk about old, we're thinking about frailty rather than an age. So this term frailty really encompasses all the things we talk about when we when we look at this care home population in a way. This is, this is a, a term given to people who are perhaps only more dependent on the on, on sport, who have a degree of dependency and phy less physiological reserves, which means that, that their body may not be able to cope well with any kind of insult or injury or any kind of adverse event. This is generally can be people in the community, but when you look at a care home population, by definition, usually they will need some degree of extra support and, and, and extra care, which is hence why they're in the, in the place where they are. Look at diabetes in this setting. It's important to be aware that if you look at data looking at the number of people with diabetes in the country, a significant number of, of, of people with diabetes are in the over 70 age group. And whilst we mentioned about age, again, this is a link between age and frailty. When you look at a frail individual, if you're talking about impact of diabetes, it works both ways. A person who has diabetes who's frail may have a number of complications that can arise from inappropriate or inadequate care. One of the key things that comes up in this group is hypoglycemia. If you think of someone as myself, if I get a hypoglycemic episode, if I fall over and, and fall, I have enough fat and muscle bulk to keep me relatively safe, reduce any kind of impact of that injury and reduce any kind of risk of fractures. Also, I don't have any other medical conditions, which therefore means that some of the other medications I may be on would cause less problems if I get a hypoglycemic episode. But if you think that for individuals, some may have osteoporosis, weaker bones, someone who may have reduced muscle bulk, muscle strength, and again, be at risk of fractures beyond maybe blood medications. Again, one hypoglycemic episode can cause significant problems in terms of hospitalization, reduced functionality, and can cause a whole lot of problems. 
So diabetes in the older adult, whilst we are in, in, interested in reducing the risk of complications of hyperglycemia, that becomes less of a concern, especially in the acute stage, as opposed to the risks of hypoglycemia. So our focus is more about reducing the risk of complications. And this is why we have a particular population and uh, we need to make sure that we're looking after them in more detail. I, I hope you can all still hear me. I think there might be an issue with the speaker at times. I will speak a little louder just in case, if that helps. Um, so this is why when we're talking about care homes, we're looking at a frailer older population who need a perhaps more focused look at, at various considerations, not just hypoglycemia, but also food and nourishment. Again, People in care homes are a particular vulnerable group, but equally we can use that to our advantage. They're in a situation where they will have some support. So again, if they're not eating well, this is an area that we can focus on to look at. And perhaps we can reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in that group by considering various options in terms of nutrition. Medication reviews, again, looking and seeing what they're on, whether that's required or not. Because they're in care homes to provide some intervention to help support their diabetes. I think that's the main part of that I want to just talk about because it's important with this group to be aware of the risks and benefits. Um, we can talk more in detail about things a, a bit later if you'd like about uh, specifics, but I think we're going into that in the current setting. Yeah, so thanks for that, Amma. That gives us a really good introduction. So it's 13% um, uh, of the population over the, with diabetes in the UK are over the age of 70. But as you say, diabetes plus age leads to frailty. And that's why we see such this huge numbers within the nursing homes. And I think you've done a really good job of highlighting the, the issues of hypoglycemia and how the physiological responses may be different in our older adults. So what we then need to look at is how we care for these people. And Sarah, can I come to you? Um, when you, With your experience of dealing with these care homes and the people looking after the people, uh, the people in care, how do we address the, the need to keep those people safe from their diabetes? Oh, thanks, David and Amar, for giving a really good overview. Um, I think the problem is, is just as Amar was saying, when people are in care homes, we, all, we know they're already vulnerable. So they're already a vulnerable adult. Um, and within the care homes, we're relying quite often on unregistered staff to look after those patients who may have quite complex problems. Um, in my experience, locally, there's quite a high turnover of staff within those homes, um, partly because they're not given maybe opportunities to do education and training, or it's an, it's an interim step, or it's something that they just, they just don't enjoy. Um, when, when you've got unregistered carers looking after people with quite complex needs, who haven't been educated or trained in that area, this is part of the problem. So when I've gone into care homes, it's not that they don't want to know or they're not keen to know, it's just that they maybe haven't given the opportunities. And if you think about di the diabetes population in care homes, sometimes in, in homes that I've been into locally, up to two thirds of those patients have some sort of diabetes. They're not all on insulin, they're not all on medication that, to treat their their diabetes but they're all at the same risk that Amar was talking about so it's it's about the real basics of looking after those patients with diabetes the very basics of how to do a blood glucose um, test how to check people's feet and like Amar said how to treat hypos we don't want people being called into ambulances and taken into hospital because they've had a hypo and and the staff haven't been able to manage it um, so because the, uh, those patients or service users have got those high dependency needs, sometimes diabetes, even very basic diabetes care, is, is often overlooked. And one of the three areas when, when we developed the programme that James will talk about is, is around hypos, foot care and, and hyperglycemia.
Thank you, Sarah. So we, we have uh, this big problem. We have frail, vulnerable adults in care homes. Often they can't really represent themselves. We have these carers looking after them who don't have the same experience that many of us have. They're not necessarily trained nurses or trained staff. And then we have the issue of trying to address those learning needs. And remember, these are different population to the doctors and the nurses that we are very used to dealing with. These are people who are very often relatively low paid, high turnover, a 30% turnover of people in nursing homes when it comes to the staffing. So there is clearly a need to provide an educational platform in order to address this. Now, I'm noticing before we move on that we've got a few people raising their hands. Unfortunately, we can't access the hand raised through this system. However, there is a Q&A bar down at the bottom. Please put any questions you have for our expert panel on this question and answer session. And that will then, in the last 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to go through as many of these as possible. So keep those questions coming in. Now, James, we've got this tremendous unmet need. Now, you are effectively a professional educator. Would you Correct, like to yeah. tell us about how you in Leicester and the Eden Group have come together to address this need? Thank you, David. And thank you also to Amar and Sarah for being part of this webinar. So my name is James Ridgway. I'm an Eden um, research educator and associate. Um, so Eden stands for Effective Diabetes Education Now. And Eden started out in 2012, providing education in Leicester. And that was around the fundamentals of diabetes care to primary health care professionals, such as um, GPs, uh, practice nurses, healthcare assistants. And we've much more expanded ourselves to the wider multidisciplinary team, including pharmacists. From our initial work within Eden in Leicester, we became more recognized nationally. So we had multiple areas um, providing our training, wanting us to, to train throughout the UK and also internationally as well. So one of the areas that when I became part of Eden uh, in 2018 uh, was around this recognition around education for care home staff being a real need. And obviously Amar and Sarah mentioned some of the uh, factors that do impact upon diabetes care. So what I did was kind of take the lead upon this care homes education role. So what I did starting out was um, going into care home uh, care homes within Leicestershire, within my local area, and I wanted to find out how things were going for them, what particular areas around diabetes uh, they wanted to know more of. So I found two quite surprising stories which kind of go into the national report, one being a service user or resident that was sadly admitted uh, due to hypoglycemia when they were not um, stopped of a medication called glycoside um, at the right time and they ended up having a severe hypo and being admitted. And what this led on to part of the education that we provide around medications then another situation that um, a care home told me about was a patient that ended up in diabetic ketoacidosis that had type 1 diabetes. And sadly, this person was in end of life. And at the time, because the patient wasn't eating as much, they, the healthcare professionals involved in their care and the care staff thought that it was appropriate at the time to uh, stop their insulin, which one of the key things we do teach is to not stop um, a person's insulin who has type 1 diabetes. It might be that some types of insulin or doses need to be reduced, but it's always important to keep it going to avoid an admission with diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis. And the emergency admissions are part of the real concern along with foot care issues and hypos. And these are things that we talk about in the care homes module as well. So from this, Ourselves in Eden and Amar and Sarah, they traipsed along to Leicester and we got together to talk about um, the, the factors that we found out and their experiences and the things that I was aware of in the care homes itself. And we came up with a plan to uh, provide and develop a face-to-face -face training similar to what we do within Eden already pre-COVID. 
So we devised um, a care home training program, which had three sessions. I'm just going to click to slide 13, David. Um, so the training program consisted of three sessions, and we wanted to structure it out in an order that would suit both healthcare assistants and nurses. And we felt that the blend of the two together would help with that multidisciplinary team aspect. So session one is about introduction to diabetes. So this is really the sort of core information that people require to get started to really understand what diabetes is and what are some of the problems and key aspects of care. So the first bit is around the types of diabetes. So some of you might be aware of type one diabetes, and some might be aware of type two diabetes. Now there's, there's the same name, but just with a different number, but they are completely different conditions. Then there are also other types of diabetes that some people not, might not be aware of. Gestational diabetes, not so common in care homes. Um, and then there are other monogenic types of diabetes that people become aware of. We just make some, make some awareness to that. Now we talk about the different types of complications that people can develop. Um, complications to the eyes, to the feet, to the nerves, to the heart. And we talk about how um, effective glycemic control, blood glucose levels and blood pressure and cholesterol can really help upon this to manage the diabetes well and prevent the complications. Then we talk about foot care. And this is a really important part of our training where we talk about what can occur with foot care problems for people with diabetes how they're more at risk. And one of the audits that came about a few years ago identified that 50% of people that live with diabetes are admitted to hospital with a foot care problem. So it's a real risk factor. So in the session that we provided, Sarah came up with a really good idea to draw around people's shoes and then put their feet and then compare it to say, well, this, this is the size of a person's foot and this is the size of their shoe. And it was surprising of just how um, minimal the area was in the space. And it was to show that it's not just the feet we have to be aware of, it's also the things that they wear as well. Then we talk about the annual review. So these are the different screening profiles that go on, the blood tests that are done, things testing for the eyes as well to prevent further complications happening or identify problems. And then throughout the training, we do around care planning. And what we did, we came up with a really good collaboration with Log My Care, who you may have heard, you may use their resources. And in our training, we provide uh, pilot um, case studies and we use their resources to look at some of the uh, topics that we covered in each of the sessions and then relate it back to some people. And the people that we provided the training for found it very effective. Then session two is called safety in diabetes. So this is around how to keep people safe in the care home to prevent the hospital admissions. So the first thing is around blood glucose monitoring, which for some people is a very simple thing. But one thing we teach is how to do the test properly from the basics of wiping the finger to interpreting the result. Then from that, we talk about the diabetes medication. So some of you may have heard of some medications such as metformin or glycolazide. So we talk about each of those, but in a nice, easy format, not too um, tax, tax, taxing or on anyone, not too hard on them. And then we also talk about the injectables. So one thing you may have heard of and, and also administer is insulin. So we talk about each of the groups of those as well. And then we talk about one of the risk factors around hypoglycemia. What is it? And we know that you may have heard it's a level below four. We say four is the floor um, and we need to treat it. So we talk about how to treat it, what are the signs and symptoms and how to reduce the risk. And then we talk about hyperglycemia and we say, well, what is it? What are the symptoms and how to avoid it? And we also talk about illness and how that can cause real significant hyperglycemia and increase their risk of hospital admission. And one thing we will obviously talk about in this session is around how COVID-19 increases the risk of hyperglycemia and therefore hospital admission and much severe complications as well. And then in the final session, which we actually found was the most beneficial, beneficial and meaningful session out of the lot for ourselves, uh, mine, me and Sarah, and the people that undertook the training is a session called quality of life and well-being in diabetes. So the first bit is around the advanced stages of life. So this is around end of life care. 
So this is all about the key points that are made about making patient-centered approaches, not stopping insulin for people with type one diabetes, make sure that they have the right medications. And then we talk around emotional well-being and mental health. So the one thing, if you can take away from this session is that um, diabetes is not just related to the physical or physical effects, but because of how long people can live with the condition for, can really impact upon their psychological well-being. And that in itself can affect upon the management of diabetes. And then we talk about other mental health problems such as dementia. And then we talk about learning disabilities. And that's a key one as well, because some of the people that you may look after will have learning disabilities or learning difficulties. And around 10% of people living with a learning disability also live with diabetes. And one of the key factors we say is around how people with learning disabilities might not be able to be independent at looking after their condition, but they want to be involved in it. So then we talk about care planning and what we did following the development of it, we collaborated with West Kent um, CCG. So I, I traveled down to Sarah's area and we provided those three training sessions to uh, 25 care home staff, both in nursing, uh, who were nurses and healthcare assistants. And our aim of the training itself was to improve knowledge and confidence. And um, understanding around that was if we improve knowledge and confidence in the care staff, then that should hopefully have a positive impact upon the um, service users management of diabetes and therefore reduce the risk for complications and hospital admission as well. So in order to identify the impact upon knowledge and confidence, we did um, a pre-training knowledge and confidence questionnaire and a post-training knowledge and confidence questionnaire. So then we wanted to identify the impact upon that training. So we're just bringing you up the slide now. So you'll see in the top table, that's what we class as the knowledge and confidence score. So it's, it's uh, gone from one to five, one meaning no knowledge or confidence and five meaning very good knowledge or confidence. So you'll see on the table below that we have a pre bit. So that's the pre-training knowledge and confidence score. And the mean result was a score of two. So the average person um, that scored in the, in the training before they had the education was that they, they showed little or no knowledge or confidence. And the highest in the areas that you'll see is a reasonable knowledge or confidence. And that gave us the understanding that people need a lot more education and understanding around diabetes. So then we provided the three training sessions and we did another knowledge and confidence questionnaire. And I think you'll see that there is a considerable difference and increase in the knowledge and confidence. In fact, from the score from two to four indicates um, an increase in knowledge and confidence by 100%. And in some areas, we increased that knowledge and confidence by 150%, which was such as emotional well-being and mental health. And I think that related back to the evaluations that we, we received. Now, one thing that we wanted to identify is that it's good to know that the knowledge and confidence has increased and improved, but we want to know, has the training been of quality and of meaning to the care home staff that took part in the training? And what we identified, and you'll see on the right side of that slide, is that they, they rated the overall training as, uh, seven, I think it was 76% rated it as excellent, and 24 rated it as good, 24%. And the other rating marks were either um, fair, poor, or of improvement, I believe. So we understood that the training was of quality. Now, our next thing was to provide another training within Leicester to see if the results were comparable to West, um, to West Kent CCG. But sadly, COVID-19 hit, and then we had to restructure our training plan. So thanks, Jane. That's a great overview of uh, this training program you put together. I mean, it's it's very clear that the people working in the care homes are effectively the eyes and ears of the doctor. Um, and I'm seeing lots of questions coming in, and there's one or two points that are on there. 
saying, well, isn't it up to the doctors to do the prescription? Isn't it up to the district nurses to come in and deliver this insulin and these elements? And to some degree, that is true. But the reality is that even before COVID, we were entirely dependent on the highly skilled care workers working in the community, working in these residential homes, in these nursing homes, in order to act as our eyes and ears, remembering that these patients with learning difficulties and dementia were, um, well, very often it's impossible for us to get the history. So James gave an overview there of how this was developed. And that did include Amar and Sarah going to Leicester. Now, clearly that's something that would not be allowed today. Uh, are you even allowed visitors anymore? Um, because the world all changed in March, as we know. And there is no group that has been more vulnerable to the effects of COVID than our frail elderly in residential care with diabetes. Amar, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yep, gladly, David. Um... The, the relationship between COVID-19 and diabetes has been developed over the last few months. Initially, we all we knew was that we had data from China and Italy, which said people with diabetes had, well, who had people with diabetes. But we didn't know anything more beyond that. But then the UK, and, and, and we've been very, one of the leaders in the world in identifying the risks of diabetes, in the setting of COVID-19. And we've had a lot of important information come through from, 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 from the patients. Um, just to give you a bit of idea of things, we know about 30, 33% of, of hosp in hospital deaths with COVID-19 in England are people with diabetes. And again, predominantly this was a large number of people with type two diabetes, but again, there was a proportion of those with type one. Um, looking, looking at specific data, looking at uh, those with diabetes and, 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 in, and mortality figures and, and COVID-19, um, we found that those with type 1 and type 2 diabetes had a higher risk of in-hospital death. And this was also linked to comorbidities, those who had cardiovascular disease, renal disease, hypertension. This is data that we've seen across the world. And certainly in, in the UK, we've got similar things. Older age, this has been one of the key things with COVID-19, poor outcomes associated with those of an older age. Um, and of course, in diabetes, there are a few other risk factors. age groups, multimorbidity. We get a pattern here and if we look at our traditionally usually a care home population person, they will have a large number of these comorbidities. So we're looking at uh, a number of people who have higher risk factors for poorer outcomes with COVID-19 and it becomes all the more important to look at them specifically to try and reduce this risk and there have been a number of different ways that people have addressed this and looked at this. Not one of the most important documents are from Diabetes UK and, and ABCD, the Joint British Diabetes Societies, who issued a particular, state, a particular set of guidance on care home management in, in older adults. Um, one of the key things they really focus on is about reducing the risks in COVID-19, minimizing the risks of adverse outcomes if someone in a care home resident does get COVID-19. We want to reduce the risks of hyperglycemia, of high blood sugars equally. We want to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, the risk of hospitalization if possible and the risk of poorer outcomes. So this is what's important. Sorry, uh, we do appear to be having some problems here with Amar's sound. Um, uh, we will be able to get back to him in just a second. But just while, I mean, Amar was just giving a very good overview there about the, the issues around COVID and the frailty and the multimorbidity. And actually, if anyone wants to know more details of that, 
there's been an, an amazing paper that's come out just today in the British Medical Journal that's been um, led by the Oxford team that includes our very good friend from Leicester, Kamlish Kunti, as well as Jonathan Balabji, talking about the multimorbidities and the increased risk. And it does highlight the fact that people in care homes have got a two and a half fold increased risk of dying of COVID, that the very elderly have got up to a 20 fold increased risk of dying of COVID, that those with multimorbidities each have a cumulative additional risk. So that by the time you get somebody with diabetes and coronavirus and living in a care home, the composite increased risk is around 400 percent of dying of COVID. Now with that in mind there is absolutely no way that the course could continue in the way it was because there's no way you can get a group of healthcare workers together in order to try and educate them because the reality is if one of them had COVID then everybody would go back to their care homes with COVID. I mean, Sarah, this is a problem that you were faced with and um, you were trying to take this to the next step. Sarah, would you like to come in and say how you dealt with those issues? Yeah, so um, firstly, yeah, there's been a couple of questions um, coming up. Just to clarify the unregistered practitioner's role is anybody who's not a registered nurse. And we use the, the term unregistered practitioner when we do the training because it's against the competencies that we use, which are national. Now, I've worked with hundreds of homes, hundreds of care assistants, HCAs, associate practitioners, and all of them, I would say, whether it's in a care home or a hospital, actually, those those, are, those practitioners are, like David said, they're the eyes and ears of, of the nursing team, of the GPs, of the district nurses. So please don't ever feel that we are downgrading HCAs at all. And, and actually you're in the right place at the right time, knowing those people to make alerts to those who may not know them. Um, so you are a fundamental part of the service. The, the key is that many of the care home staff aren't always given access to training, which is why we've developed some training. Um, and in the past, I've de delivered care home training to my local area, supported by grants from industry, um, because we know that actually you sit in the middle of the community. You are, you are the you have a lot of community patients in there and we are relying on your services to look after those patients. So when we started looking at training, say myself and James went um, to West Kent and trained 25, 25 people, got the good results that you've seen that James has presented. Um, and one of the things, one of the things that we really focused on are really are really basic things, but these basic things are the things that stop people going into hospital. We don't expect you to change medication or to stop insulin, but maybe to have a little bit more understanding and knowledge to maybe challenge what you think might not be right. And don't presume that registered practitioners know as much about diabetes as you do, because there's still a lot of registered practitioners, nurses, that, that aren't specialists in diabetes. And with the education and training that we give, we would, we would almost raise your knowledge uh, above and beyond that. So one of the key things that we looked at was giving really basic messages to, to those care homes. And, and, the, and the basic messages are having a hypo treatment kit hypo box now if you haven't got hypo boxes it doesn't have to be anything fancy it's something that you put you have a box that you put that particular person's hypo treatment in so if they do have a hypo it's already agreed what you're going to treat them with you don't need to run around getting cups of tea with sugar in it's there it's ready and it's been agreed on their care plan so that's one of the key things is that a really basic, simple thing is how do I treat a hypo? There's your hypo box, there's your agreed plan. 
have plenty of blood glucose testing strips. Most homes now do carry out home uh, blood glucose monitoring, not all. Some people don't feel they feel confident to do that. And if you're doing blood glucose monitoring, it's about what you do with those results once you've tested that blood, um, because writing it in a book and not sharing it probably isn't that useful. So the training that we, we give is around setting people's targets, when we would expect them to test their blood, where we would expect them to share those results. And also know your community healthcare team. Um, and I've, I've worked in all areas of diabetes, and I think your key your key link should be to your community diabetes team. All areas will have them in some form or another. Some are attached to hospitals, some are completely separate. But they, the district nurses rely on us for, for their diabetes support, and there's no reason that you can't rely on us as well. Um, foot care, I think James is um, has talked about foot care. Most hospital admissions with diabetes are, are preventable. Um, as Amara has already alluded to, hypoglycemia is a big risk, but the other biggest risk for people coming into hospital is foot problems or foot disease. And if you just get into the habit of looking at people's feet every day and knowing what's normal and what's not and alerting the GP, um, as soon as you notice anything different, that will potentially reduce hospital admission, reduce a foot ulcer. Because once you have a foot ulcer, a foot problem is very, very hard to deal with. So prevention is definitely better than cure. Okay. You also administer diabetes medications. Most times they're in a dosset box. You, when we did the training, most, well, about half of them, I'd say, probably knew some of the names of the diabetes medications. They didn't always know the way they worked. So it was, that was one of the things that we talked about was what the types of medication, the how they work and what they do. And it's a good idea just to know very basics of those medications, especially if they can cause hypos. And there are some groups of medication that can cause hypos. If you know those groups and you know that person's at risk of hypos or they're having hypos, it, it's good to flag that up to the GP or the district nurse, whoever's coming in to you. We, we tend to set individual targets for people within care homes, and that should be agreed with the staff and the patient or their family. The targets for diabetes control are a bit looser with those with, with frailty and we're not just, remember we're not just talking about the elderly population, we're talking about those who are frail, so not just those in care homes but those who are dependent on district nurses in the community um, who have got a dependency on healthcare professionals. The biggest risk for those people is, is hypos. So the targets are a little bit more relaxed between six and 12, six and 14. But it's really important that when you do a care plan or, or go through the care plan with those people, that those targets are included. So you know, if they're out of target, they're out of target, what's my plan? Where's, what do I do? Who do I report this to? because we're not expecting you to be doctors and nurses and make medication decisions but it's about flagging up those things that actually do need input from those from those other healthcare professionals we've had a little bit around diet we've had some questions around diet and fluid and we did quite a big session on that um diet and fluids People forget sometimes about fluids. We, we focus on diet with diabetes, but actually fluids and hydration are just as if not more important to, to monitor than maybe what, what, what they're eating. So that, yes, that is part of the module. And it's something that, again, should be part of their care plan. So all of the things that I've just talked about here it is, is kind of putting that all together in a care plan. Um, and we've used Log My Care um, and myself and James had a bit of a play with it and, and there's all that opportunity to put things like that on there if you use other things as LogMyCare I'd imagine similar things but it's documenting what you're expecting and what to do if things fall out of those parameters. Thank, Thank you Sarah. So, th so there's a great overview of some of the content of this presentation um, but 
one of those key elements is that the education couldn't be delivered. I mean, the ed ever, the, it had great success, didn't it, James? I mean, we, we, we saw that there was tremendous benefit. I mean, even three months later, you were telling us, but how, let's go through some of the successes you had and then how you met the challenge of continuing to deliver that in a post-COVID world. Absolutely, thank you, David. So, James. Sorry, Dave, I think your signal went bad there. Um, if we go to slide 16, if possible, um, we therefore wanted to know what was the ongoing impact following the training, the face-to-face -face training. And these are some of the really crucial statements that we received from the care home staff that took part in the face-to-face -face training. So one of them was around rolling out foot care training to all our care home staff. Another mentioned similar and the fact they had no further foot problems since. And these statements came three months after the training that we had delivered. Another was training helped to stabilize um, blood sugar levels or blood glucose levels for service users with insulin. Um, Sarah mentioned about the importance of communicating with the, the diabetes team, and that's what someone else mentioned. Another mentioned around introducing daily foot care checks. Another mentioned about being more proactive in identifying hyperglycemia. Um, another mentioned around taking the training on and, and training their other care staff as well. Another mentioned around the importance of care planning and making individualized care plans around hypos and hyperglycemia. And then another aspect we talk about in the training is around how to treat hypo, hypoglycemia in terms of first the quick acting carbohydrates and then the long acting carbohydrates. And that's what a care home did in terms of creating a poster for both sets of um, treatments to effectively manage uh, diabetes. So then we knew that it was an ongoing success in terms of the training. And as David said, we can't do face-to-face -face training during these times because of the risk uh, for both ourselves as trainers and yourselves as delegates or as, as learners. So what we did, we devised um, an online uh, program called CARES, which we originally start, um, stood for Care Home Education and Safety. And this is an online program containing one recorded lesson around um, what CARES is, the different lessons that are involved, and some of the key points. So around end of life care, hypoglycemia, uh, hyperglycemia, the different types of diabetes, just did a really nice snapshot. It gives you a nice refresher um, if you, when you complete the training. Then we provide three e-learning modules, and these are the same structure as we did the face-to-face -face training. So the first set, first module being introduction to diabetes, the second one being safety in diabetes, and the third being emotional well-being and um, emotional well-being in, in diabetes. So, so it gives a nice review of everything we have done just in a nice condensed way, really interactive as well. So then following that, once you've done the e-learning, we do three, if that takes around a few months, three months process, we then get together in groups of cohorts of around six to 10, and you'll be part of what we call an online um, mentoring session. Uh, we call it an online group forum discussion, where we gather together all our learning experiences on the training program. We discuss some case studies. You, you can bring some case studies to the session and we can really kind of summarize and, and go over things. And if you've got anything you need to clarify, then we can, as a group, work through that together as well. And then we also like to identify the impacts that the training has had. So again, you will do a, a knowledge and confidence score at the start of the training, and again, at the end of the training program as well. And we have some further information on how you can contact the Eden team around CARES um, during these moments in time. What I will say is that once everything is blown over regarding COVID, hopefully at some point soon in the future, we do intend to do face-to-face -face training again, but when safe to do so. So at the moment, it's the online training program at the moment. Thank you, James. So we are we're now coming into the questions and answers sessions and we have lots and lots of questions and comments that are all coming in. Um, the, the first is actually one comment that I'm afraid and I do have to apologize. I did not in any way mean to undermine the value of the carers working in the residential homes and nursing homes. Um, I know that when I visit them on a regular basis, 
you are the eyes and ears. You provide a tremendous care. And I do have to start with an apology if in any way, shape or form, you, you believe that I did not respect the job that you do. You do a tremendous job. And I can say this confidently, knowing that my son is a carer in a nursing home, and I am so proud of the role that he has taken on. So please accept my apologies if you feel that any of the terminology I use was in any way using it derogatory. None of us on this um, call, none of us on this webinar believe that in any way your job is in any way less than what we are providing as doctors, nurses, as care workers, you are doing a job that I could never do. So I am going on to, to go through some of these questions that we have. And the first question is a question that I'm going to pose to Amar. It came from an anonymous attendee. It was talking about the use of insulin uh, and talking about those hypoglycemias that you've spoken about. If you have a person who is end of life, how do we deal with insulin and the risk of hypoglycemia in their end of life care? Amar, over to you. Yeah, no, thank you, David. Um, I've got accessories now to see if that helps with the sound. Uh, Much better. <laughs> right, so end of life care is a, a very important area, and especially in the care home setting. When we think about end of life care, there's, there's various aspects of end of life care. There's, there's a bit where you think the person is approaching end of life in coming days, weeks, months, or there's the immediate end of life care, when the body systems are shutting down and you're focusing, again, those, those last interim periods. The whole aim of blood sugar monitoring or blood sugar control really in that group, if you can call it control, it's about avoiding hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia and symptomatic, so symptoms is what we're looking at. We're not too focused on blood sugar monitoring, except to make sure that if they have any symptoms that we're treating that appropriately. We switch, when we're looking at regimes and, and insulins, we want a simple regime. Usually for most people, especially in, in those with type one we're talking about because they need insulin, we would switch to a, a basal regime. In those with type two, we would look and see whether they needs to be on any medications. And if they needed to be on, if they were on insulin, we again would aim to switch to a, a once a day injection. And again, we're looking for a simplified regime, just enough to keep avoidance of hypoglycemia and avoid to make it go too high. So we're trying to not give them too much insulin, but not too little either. And it's about monitoring their symptoms from that side of things to see if we need to treat them. Thanks, uh, Amma. So a uh, next question that we have, uh, the next question I'm going to pose to Sarah, because it's, it's very much one that's up your street. This is from Christopher Walton. Thank you for putting your comment in. In view of the high turnover staff of some care homes, we often wonder whether the care home manager is the best source of continuity. Should there be systematic offering of a high level of education for these people? Or do we think that they already have too much on their plate? Sarah, I'm going to pose that one to you first. Um, thanks, David, and thanks. It's a really relevant question because you're quite right in that the turnover of staff generally um, applies to the, um, the, the non-management staff. Um, senior carers tend to stay more, but it is in, in anything that you do training with, it's a bit like painting the false bridge. Even in hospitals, when we did training of staff, you do one group and you think, great, I've, I've, that, that ward's fine. Um, but then staff would change because staff do. Opportunities come along, um, people take them and or people move on for different reasons. The level of, the level of training that we give is, is well, that Eden gives is slightly more than basic, but probably something that everybody knows or needs to know. So we, when we did the training with Eden, we had the, the managers, senior carers and carers all given the same information. And there's no reason why you couldn't select some people from your home to go and be sort of those links into diabetes because the resources that people are given on the course and on the training are, can be used with everybody. And actually, if one person goes back and tells one more person the risk of hypos or to check Mr. Smith's feet, then we're, we're, 
that's going to have success all the way through. So it really doesn't matter where you start, so long as that person's got an interest in diabetes, is willing to learn and is willing to share that information with their staff. Thanks. Uh, and, and James, I mean, what experience do does Eden have of working with those care managers? So thank you, David. So, yeah, so we like to try and collaborate with healthcare professionals before we do um, some form of training. So as we mentioned with the care homes program, we are providing those mentoring um, sessions as well. And part of those mentoring sessions, we, we also invite um, healthcare professionals that are heavily involved in uh, diabetes care in the care home setting. So when I do the mentoring sessions, I will be alongside a diabetes specialist nurse who also works in the care home setting as well. In relation to what Sarah was saying in the question before, I think in terms of this continuity, the CARES program really sets this apart in terms of you have a program available that is sustainable and reusable. And it's not just the, the trainers needing to be those of experience, it's trainers that need to be passionate in training about diabetes. And you saw in some of the responses that we had in terms of the impact statements, just around how future training uh, was provided to all sorts of professionals in the care home setting. And in relation to what David was saying around no, no disrespect to anyone in terms of um, registered nurses and unregistered, I was a um, senior carer and a care assistant in a care home setting prior to my nursing qualification and introduction into diabetes as well. So I fully acknowledge where you're coming from, but in relation to the question in terms of continuity, the CARES programme really sets this apart. So uh, thanks for that, James. Uh, so we've actually got several questions coming in on a similar theme around um, insulin in the care homes when the blood sugar is low. Um, Amma, with your physician's hat on, when you, when you get these calls, I mean, I know I quite regularly get these calls. We have a patient whose blood sugar is 4.2. Should I be giving their insulin? Amma, how would you respond to that? Right, yes, now this is a very important question. As we mentioned, it's about reducing the risk of hypoglycemia, but also a lot of people not denying them insulin when they need it. So it's finding that balance. Um, the key thing with anyone who's got a low or borderline low, so 4.2 means it's, it's, it's not quite less than four, which is this magic number where it starts to be a hypo, but it's on the lower side. <laughs> so we want to reduce the risk of that. First thing, we want to make sure that I would say with anyone who's got a low blood sugar level, you want to see what's happening to the blood sugars before that as well. Has it always been, has it always been on the lower side or has it been, have there been frequent hypos before? Because that gives you an idea if they do need as much insulin as they're having. Um, at that moment, I would say the important thing is to make sure that they have something on board to prevent them dropping their blood sugars lower. So we're looking at maybe not a, a treatment for hypoglycemia in terms of a quick acting carbohydrate, but certainly a, a carbohydrate that would get on board to keep their blood sugar steady. And with regards to their insulin, I would say if they're on long acting insulin and they, this is just a one off reading, we would want to review to see whether we need to reduce the dose slightly or keep it steady. But it's the quick acting insulin that's the worry in that setting. If someone's got a low blood sugar reading and is not eating much and you give them their quick acting insulin, then that may become an issue because then they may become more hypoglycemic. So it depends on what type of insulin they're on. And so if they're on quick acting, I would want to make sure that they have something on board that they're eating to avoid the hypoglycemia and monitor their blood sugars after. If they're on a long acting, that can be given, but you may need to keep an eye on what's happened before to see if you need to reduce the dose a little bit. Thanks, Omar. So um, I know we did lose sound for just a bit in the moment, in the middle there, but I think the basic summary of what Amor was saying is if this is a long acting insulin, so that would be something like an insulatard or a glargine or a degladec or a tajeo or one of these long acting insulins, then we do still give it because that's looking at the overall 24 hours. If it's a short acting insulin, then we need to question is it appropriate? And to be honest, do we need to start questioning, should they be on a short acting insulin at all if all we are aiming to do is maintain an average blood sugar that's in a, a good general range? Because let's face it, we are looking at a disease that has problems over 15 to 20 years. 
we're not overly worried about the 15 to 20 year problems for a 95 year old because if they get to 110 and their only problem is a bit of retinopathy then they have nothing to worry about. So I'm going to throw the next question to you James. Um, this is a question that's been looking specifically at how much research have Eden done into the impact of their educational programs and you, you really fit the bill. You are a researcher and you're an educationalist. What is the evidence that this stuff is beneficial to our patients? So thank you, David. So in terms of the research side, um, what we're very privileged to have is that we're based within the Leicester Diabetes Centre and they comprise of both clinical research and one of them being, as David mentioned, around the vaccines that are going on. And they have multiple um, clinical trials that go on in terms of therapies, in terms of management of different types of diabetes. In terms of the family experiences of, of how type 1 diabetes is managed, we do provide education around type 1 diabetes as well. And I'm incredibly passionate around this because I live with type 1 diabetes and have done so for the past eight years as well. And we do provide, we used to provide face-to-face -face education and we also have an e-learning module on type 1 diabetes, which is currently being updated because we have the wonderful um, senior clinicians and consultant of of um, Dr. Chowdhury, who um, has come from L uh, London. So he's uh, reviewing our modules with us at the moment. Um, in terms of managing elderly and frail, we have an older person module as well. In terms of hospital management, we have a um, hospital inpatient module as well. But for, for people in the care home setting, the, everything kind of comes together. We have provided a fully comprehensive module that has everything that you need so my advice would be to to use the, the program and then if there's anything further that you want to um, learn or understand then you are more than welcome to come back to us and we can choose a, a comprehensive or bespoke education program for you that meets your needs thank you and we are getting many any questions along a very similar line going on here um actually there's two particular themes coming up is do we get a CPD certificate for it? Yes, of course you do. All we need to do is once you've got to the end of this, you can log in and you will get a CPD certificate sent through to the email that you registered with. And the other is how do we access this? At the end of the seminar, I'm going to put up a slide that's going to have all of the contact details of Eden that will have their email address. If you just drop them an email, James and the amazing team that work up there in Leicester will get back to you to talk about how this has, uh, how this can be accessed wherever you may be. Um, but Sarah, you were involved in that original project. What are you doing with this now? Well, the original project started probably at DPC a couple of years ago when I developed a package of training for care homes anyway and Leicester have taken it and done this wonderful thing and it's barely recognisable to what it was but it was always around competencies and it was all around, always around people's ability to do those things um, to look after those patients in care homes and in the community. So with the success that we carried out in, in Maidstone um, and recognising some of the issues that some of you have raised around community nursing, visiting housebound patients who aren't in care homes or nursing homes. Um, at Medway, we are actually going to run this for our community nursing teams. So the information that carers get, unregistered practitioners, those who aren't nurses, but who work in care homes or are care managers, senior carers, will be getting the same training as our, as our registered nurses, our newly qualified registered nurses, or our new to community district nurses. Because the questions that you're, the, all the questions that I'm seeing on the side here, that we have questions from those community nursing teams as well. Things about treating hypos, end of life care, diet, lifestyle, blood glucose monitoring. We presume that as nurses, they, they know what, what they're doing every day and that they're competent in that. But actually our experience and, and our questioning has suggested that actually, actually they don't. So we are gonna pilot this in January, February from next year with 30 of our community nurses. So I think the, what, 
myself and James did at the beginning of the year back in Maidstone, we'll just continue to develop and roll. The fact that we've got the online version now is, is amazing. Um, the face-to-face -face option in the future. So it's, it's not just restricted for nursing homes. I'm really looking forward to doing that within, within Medway community, definitely. Fabulous. So I am very aware that we are coming towards the end of our time and I'm going to ask each of our speakers just to give a quick one sentence summary. There are a couple of questions that are coming through that are regular and I want to say we have close to 100 questions that we haven't answered yet um, and I, that is the problems with the, these sorts of formats. We will keep Keep hold of all of these questions and I know that in um, just under a month's time at the Diabetes Professional Care Congress, which is a free to register for Congress, which is going to be running mornings and evenings on the 11th, 12th and 13th of November. I'm online again with my good friend Amar and we will have a session entirely devoted to care home and people living with diabetes in a care home. We're gonna keep hold of as many of these questions as possible and we will go through as many of them then. And by that time, I will have beaten Amar around the head enough that he's got his microphone fixed before then. Um, so just before we go into the ritual floggings, James, what is the one thing that you want to take away from this meeting? Well, I want to um, actually say a quote from uh, Professor Alan Sinclair, who um, specializes in the care home setting. And it's really kind of brought it home to me around the impact of diabetes in care homes. So he says, within a care home environment where advancing age, chronic disease, frailty and disability concentrate among residents, diabetes imposes an extra health burden that stretches the capacity and skills of many care staff beyond their ability. And it is no wonder that hospital admission results. And he goes on further to say how the impact of education can help prevent those sort of occasions. Fabulous, so that, that is right at the core of it, that if we can keep people healthier, we can keep them out of hospital. And the best way to do that is by better engagement and this great educational platform. Sarah, What's the one key takeaway message that you want to give to people? Just stick to the basics, really. It, it really is about the basics that keep people out of hospital. And, and just also someone once told me that the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So if you find yourself walking past those standards and you want to improve things, then this is your opportunity to have a look at what's being offered for those people with diabetes. Brilliant. So it's basically grasp these opportunities as you get it. And just to put a little side note to that, we've had a fair few questions about the charge for the course. Uh, currently, I have to say that there is a charge for the course, but uh, when I put the contact details up for Eden, get in touch with them. There is plans that we can try and get pharma sponsored. There are many industry that will sponsor this sort of educational platform because the pharmaceutical industry is a very firm believer that with better understanding comes better diabetes care. And despite what some people might have us believe, the, the, the pharma industry is really striving to improve the diabetes and the way people are living with diabetes in the whole country. Amma, what's the one takeaway message that you want to take away from this? Firstly, I sincerely apologize for the microphone. I have no idea why, and I'll try and resolve it as soon as possible. <laughs> and I expect the beatings from David, yeah. <laughs> um, right, the one thing to come is really this, Care home management of people with diabetes is an important aspect that involves the multidisciplinary team. All of us are involved in this. All of us are here to support each other to ensure that those in the care home setting and anyone with diabetes are looked after and protected from any undue risks or any complications that they may be able to avoid. Fabulous. So as you, you say there, that the, the importance element is keeping people healthy and let's try and do our best to keep that better as for as long as we can 
So on that note, I want to say thank you to you for participating. Um, we really hope that you've taken something away from this, that there are these care, that, that there are these packages that can help train people in a care home. And obviously, once you've been trained, you then become the trainer. You can then pass that on and everybody can then have a role. In just a moment, I'm going to put up a couple of slides. They're going to be the contact details for Eden. All do take a note of that because if you get in touch with them, we can find a way to provide care some way, provide that education to improve all of our lives living with diabetes. I want to thank again the Care Network that many of you have got in touch with us through this. I want to thank DPC who have um, kindly hosted this. I want to put a big thank you out there to Sanofi who've given us the handoff grant that's enabled us to provide this education. Please feel free to log on to the uh, Sanofi's network and also onto the Eden Care Network in order that you can all get access. After this, you will get an invitation to complete a review of what, how we did, what you would like us to take forward, what you enjoyed, what you enjoyed slightly less. We all need to learn the best way of doing it. Once you complete that evaluation form, your, care, your certificate for CPD will be sent to you. And also obviously details of how to log for our free DPC conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of November, when many of these questions that have been asked will hopefully be answered at that point. Thank you all for participating. A huge thank you to James, Sarah and Amar. And I look forward to seeing you in November. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>